Hello everybody, welcome to the Little Lighthouse. I'm Carly and I'll be your host. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a writer, musician, and active citizen living in Encinitas, California. I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I am really, really excited to introduce Aruni Wejessingha. Um, feel free to tell me if I'm getting your name wrong. <laughs> um, so Aruni is a working poet, an ESL teacher, and also a maker who makes all sorts of beautiful things in crochet. So welcome, Aruni. Hi, thanks, Carly. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's exciting to be here. Hi, Ami. My mom's out there. <laughs> Hello, mom. Hi. <laughs> so, um, and hi to my friends who have come from uh, all over the place, really, to tune in. Um, that's really kind of you. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to read poems from different projects I have going. Um, the poem that uh, I think prompted Carly to ask me to read at Little Lighthouse was published uh, online in a literary magazine out of Los Angeles, California, called uh, Angel Sight Literary West. I had written it in a workshop that I'm in with Terry and um, Alexandra Umlas, um, and the prompt was, apologize for a mistake you made in the past. And um, I read it at another reading series I attend regularly and I featured at called Rorschach. And the same person who published me the very first time asked if she could publish this in their inauguration issue of Angel's Flight. And we dedicated it to um, Vice President Kamala Harris, the first Indian American and African American woman, Vice President and uh, seeing someone who represents me rise to such a seat of power has been an amazing experience. So. Once again, I would like to dedicate this poem to um, Vice President Harris, um, who feels the way I do about names. This is Cardamom Vowels. Your name is not an apology, the sound kowtowing to ears accustomed to Jennifer's and Debbie's. You are a namesake for a temple rising in the Chow Praya River, face to the morning sun. Your name is mantra, meant for repetition. Your name is not a question, voice rising at the end. Unlearn the habit of asking. Hold the magic of Sanskrit in your throat. Orient yourself with definitions, red dawns, lotus offerings, the padding steps of lion's feet in the forests of rare trees, groves that tremble incantation. Your name is not a punchline. You are not obliged to accept awkward nicknames and laugh not required to contort your tongue into a foreign shape. Don't grow towards mispronunciation, dividing yourself into two people. Remove ill-fitting shoes that chafe along the seams. Roam barefoot in the halls of your name. Unlearn a lifetime of answering to not your name. Make them taste your name, their unknowing tongues prickling with tamarind. Shape their mouths around cardamom vowels, your syllables turmeric. Teach them to whisper spice, intone fire. So um, I am hoping this poem will be a cornerstone in a solo collection. I'm working on my first full length uh, poetry collection with Silver Star Laboratories. I will drop that in the chat later. Um, so I, I just, it's a, Names are a subject I feel very passionately about, so um, I'm hoping this will be one of the cornerstone poems in the book. Um, before my full length collection, I have a chapbook coming out with Moontide Press, and I'm happy that a couple of other Moontide authors are here in the audience, so thank you for being here. And um, the collection will be um, all erasure poetry taken from the text of Love in the Time of Cholera, which to me is a book that talks about everything in the human existence and it's like my Bible. So this is a poem. This is the poem I wrote in a workshop and it sort of sparked the idea of writing a whole collection of erasure poetry. So this is taken from Love in the Time of Cholera and it's titled In the Arcade of Scribes. Insatiable to read stories cruel and most perverse, he would recite me at literary evenings, his familiarity acute. 
reading poetry like finding an oasis. He devoured me. Bought from the bargain booksellers, me, the last, the least of the local poets. He read as if ordained by fate, clear that he preferred verse and love. He memorized me and heartrending, he learned. So um, I'll talk a little bit about erasure later on. Um, I was lucky enough to co-author a collection with two of my dear friends, Shannon Phillips and Suzanne Allen. This is the book. It's super exciting for me because uh, I don't know if you can see, but it's the first time I've ever had my name on the cover of a book. <laughs> so this is my first book, baby. It's super exciting. And this was born out of a concept of uh, seeing the connect, we were exploring the connection between belly dance and the poetic impulse, uh, which is kind of a bizarre idea, <laughs> I'm sure, to many people. But um, we conducted a series of workshops where we would uh, dance for 90 minutes and write for 90 minutes and it, with a group of women. And, um, and this book was born out of that. It's a collection of essays, poetry prompts, and poems. So I have a few poems in here. And I'm going to read one that is um, an erasure poem, and it's taken from the prologue of A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. And when I read this, I realized that although um, we were taught to think that the Sultan drives the action, it's really the sister of Scheherazade who helps her hatch this plan to extend her life um, through storytelling. So it shows the importance of storytelling to women as uh, a life-saving activity. Uh, this is titled, Her Tale Begins. Sister, I want your help as a last favor, your company this last night I am alive. Wake me before the dawn and speak, I beg you. One of your charming stories shall deliver the people. The hour arrived, bade her raise her veil, her eyes full. A sister tenderly grant me before the sun rises, one of your charming stories. Pleasure of hearing you. Answer, sister. As my sister asks, said she. So Scheherazade began. Thank you. And um, finally, this, um, so my parents emigrated from Sri Lanka to New York City. Talk about culture shock. And um, our first house was in a place called Tappan, New York, which is in Rockland County. And um, in my recollection, it was just a magical childhood growing up um, in New York. And um, the whole book is going to be a love, a love letter to my family and to, um, and to the life my parents made for us. So this is about um, those early days in, or in a, and tapping in our house on Two River Place. It's titled Rockland County Canticle. Detonation of crabapple tree frothing pink, shooting scars the stars the length of each branch, profusion of lovely. Ticking sprinkler head counting down the morning, parse each flung rainbow. Whisper drift of dandelion down caught on the updraft this first inhalation of summer. Intoned mantra of lawnmower blades, counterpoint drum of garden rake across Bermuda blue. Trill of tomatoes still swelling the vine, bursting seeds impatient with waiting. Squeak of swing set chains, bottoms of our sneakers leave footprints on the clouds. Drip of jello popsicles overflowing Dixie cups, trickle down forearms, sugar stains blooming our bare knees. Squawk of crow struggling in the jaws of our orange tabby breaks free, spirals into the blue. Murmur pussy willow velvet, brush across lips pursed, soft, kitten dreaming. Humming cicadas fill the dusk, violin string pulse of life, mating calls herald a distant dawn. Sigh, the screen door hinges, soft click of latches, shut the hymnals, close the night.
So this is just a little sampling of what I'm working on this year <laughs> as I'm working towards a couple of collections coming out. Beautiful. Thank Thanks, you Carly. so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let everybody uh, applause you. So it, on the count of three, if everybody wants to uh, take themselves off mute for a second and show Aruni some love, that would be awesome. Are you ready? Three. Are you ready? Two. One. <laughs> Yay. 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 <laughs> Amazing. You are the best little lighthouse crowd that has ever, ever been here. So thank you for your enthusiasm and I'll remind you at this point to mute yourselves for a little bit, just so we can, again, just so we can do the interview. Um, I could listen to you read poetry all night long, Aruni, and I'm sure as we have other poets in the house, that's what um, they would like to hear too. But I'm really excited just to chat with you. Um, You're so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to start by just on kind of, uh, an intense note, just asking how you are. It's been a crazy couple of weeks. Um, we've been through a lot with shootings. One the other day, which was actually um, my sister's grocery store in Colorado. So, gosh, is she all right? She's all good. Her boyfriend is all good too. Um, but I could imagine being Sri Lankan American um, that the impact that the impact of the first shooting was a lot for you. Um, how are you doing? Um, you know, I was just thinking and it's, I feel like there are three strikes against me walking out the door. I'm a woman, I'm a person of color and I'm Asian. Um, but um, if you've ever watched the Hassan Minhaj one man show, uh, Homecoming King, he talks about, you know, this is the, this is the price we pay to live here. And um, I think for all of my life, it was something in the back of my mind and it's been propelled to the front of my mind uh, since 2016. And um, my friend, my dear brother, friend Shawhead is here. And um, this is a conversation we've had a lot and um, we're not going anywhere. We're Americans as much if not more so than everyone else. And we've earned the right to be here and we've earned the right to be unafraid. And so, you know, part of me thinks you can keep shooting and we'll just keep coming. What are you gonna do? Yeah, true that. And maybe hopefully enough people will speak up that we can finally stop this gun violence or at least make it less and the epidemic of racism in our country, you know, enough of us will speak up to make you sure know, that you don't feel unsafe in our country. Done. As people of color, it's something you're acutely aware of from the minute you wake up in the morning. And I think now the white majority is well aware that um, racism exists. It's, it's, we're not a post-racial society. And it's been illuminating to see how many of my non-BIPOC friends are so surprised at all of this. I've, I've never been surprised at any of this. Um, in a funny way, it's a relief because it's easier to confront something head on rather than um, have to skirt around things that no one's willing to talk about. Yeah. Well, and I think the more we have conversations and I identify as white, um, the more I have conversations with my white friends and family about these things too. And just, I think it needs to become more normalized that we talk about it and talk about um, the issues that have been going on in this country since it was founded, you know? Right. It's, you know, this country, people existed on this continent long before Europeans arrived. It, they didn't discover America. They happened upon it. There, there was culture here before. And um, it heartens me to see indigenous people um, standing up for themselves and, and asserting their identity and asserting their culture. And um, a big theme in my life right now and as an adult and my eyes are open is um, it's time to decolonize this country. 
it's the, from the minute you go to school, you're colonized by these ideas of what it is to be American and what it is to participate in society. And I just hope that, you know, as I keep working on my writing, I can decolonize myself first and my own mind first and then put work out there that reflects an American experience because it's my experience. Yeah, definitely. I wanna talk more about decolonization and maybe um, we'll back up for a little bit because I, I also want you to share your story because it's amazing that you in 2016, you didn't consider yourself a writer. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> at all. And Not then, at all. At, you know, in 2017, um, you became a poet and uh, started publishing work. And now you've been published nationally and internationally. Um, and also we're expecting all, all of these uh, forthcoming collections. Um, so how did, how did that all happen for you? And yeah. So, um, so I got my undergraduate degree from UCLA in, um, in English literature, and I was actually one class away from being a creative writing major in short fiction. Um, in retrospect, I can see now that that was not my medium. That was, um, that length of prose was really not my sweet spot in writing. Never really pursued writing at all. It took like in sometime in the mid 1990s, took a poetry workshop through UCLA Extension because I lived on the West Side and um, I didn't really click with that group of people and wrote some things. The only poem I salvaged from that was something that became um, my paternal grandmother's eulogy, but that was written a long time ago. Um, wrote a little bit in the early 2000s, just as a fun project. I was working at a community college and uh, one of the instructors in the department where I worked said, why don't you do a poetry project with me? never really went anywhere with it. And then in 2017, I had one of my dearest friends in life um, die tragically, was murdered in Lima, Peru. And um, earlier that spring, I had attended Rorschach, which is my favorite reading series in Echo Park, Los Angeles. I went with my husband, Jeff, because um, he was in a novel writing workshop and the instructor, Melanie Thorne was, um, reading. She was one of the featured readers at Rorschach. And I'd never been to a reading series. I didn't go to poetry readings, open mics, nothing. I had nothing to do with the writing community whatsoever. But we went to this event and um, I just really hit it off with David Rocklin, who is the founder and organizer. He's um, an LA area novelist and just the best of people um, and has become one of my dearest friends and advocates. And um, Afterwards, we were milling around and Jeff and I went and introduced ourselves and Jeff identified himself as one of Melanie's students and David turned to me and said, are you a writer too? And I said, no. And Jeff said, yes. <laughs> so then David said, well, which is it? And he asked me to send him a writing sample and I had exactly one poem published, which was for um, a friend's, she, she did a book as a fundraiser for her child's PTA. So there were 20, she ran a blog we all contributed um, stories to the blog. It was about um, your days in elementary school. And there are 29 uh, short fiction pieces and one poem. <laughs> the poem's fine. Um, so I sent it to David, we became friends. And um, that summer, my friend was murdered, my friend Alex Duenas. And uh, I just wound up pouring my heart out to David because it was easier to tell a stranger, a relative stranger, you know, this traumatic thing that had happened. And he said, I think maybe you should write something about your friendship with Alex and about his death and just process, just get it out of your system, process your grief. And though I, I resisted this idea, but then I finally caved in, wrote a really long prose poem um, that's, that's actually published on the um, Angel Slight Literary West site. Um, and it was called Walking in Santiago After Midnight. And it just, it's somewhat about um, time I spent with him in Chile. And then David, <laughs> in his very, David is my friend way, pushed me into the pool and said, you're gonna feature at Rorschach and you're gonna read this poem and you're just gonna do it. And I'm not gonna hear any argument about it. And I just thought, I, I don't read aloud. I'm not a poet. I'm not part of this community. I just wanna sit and listen to other people read. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so I read, I like shaking like a leaf, like the page was trembling. And um, I read this basically an elegy to my friend and Michelle Raphael, who is one of the founders of Angel's Flight approached me at the end of the reading and said, I think our readers would really resonate with the story. I'd like to publish you. And I thought, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I have no design to be published. I, this is not what I do. I, this is a one-off. And um, she gave me her email and said, please reach out to me. I, I want to do this. Let's do this. And um, published my poem. It got some traction on their website. And then she invited me to read for um, Women's Month. Uh, I had one poem, <laughs> what was I gonna do? So I wrote another poem, read it, and um, it just kind of took on a life of its own because people would come to events that I would read at and I was only writing poems for occasions. Like if somebody heard me read, they'd say, oh, I'm doing this event, um, it's about X, can you write a poem about X? And it just went piecemeal. And then, um, and I'm working on multiple different things. I've I've been afforded amazing opportunities. The literary community in LA and Orange County is so generous and they've been so incredibly kind to me and, um, and given me a voice and convinced me that I have something to say. So um, <laughs> unintentionally, I'm developing this weird career. Yeah. Uh, but I have more focus and direction than I did four years ago. Yeah. No, that's just amazing. Well, and what strikes me too is the timing, right? Because here you are, you weren't a writer before then. Um, but in this last four or five years since 2016, like the, the conversations in our society have really been developing around women's voices and the importance of people of color's voices. And so, yeah, how does it feel to have found your your voice in writing during this really super transformative time in our um, culture too. It's funny in many ways, uh, people of color have, have suddenly achieved cachet, uh, which I find hilarious because we've always been here. We've always been uh, part of society. And when you consider in South Asia alone, there are you know, one and a half billion people. It's, it's we're, we're a population to be reckoned with. And um, I think people are more conscious that we don't live in a homogeneous world. Um, I've been lucky in that I've found outlets and I've found, um, found my tribe of people who, who are encouraging me to speak up and, and, and tell my own truth in my own way. Um, I studied English literature and, and when you study English lit, it, with very few exceptions, you're studying dead male Europeans. And that's the standard against which writing is measured. And, um, and that's, a, that's a huge form of colonization. Like you're inculcated from, from your first, you know, Beowulf to 16, you know, Beowulf to whatever, with this idea that um, the gold standard against which all writing in English is measured is hundreds of years old and antiquated and, and, and not relevant to so many people who write in English. And um, once I let go of that need to assuage ears that are used to white male authors <laughs> dead long ago, um, it, it broke open my own, if I have a style, it, it broke it open. And uh, you know now I don't feel like I need to write about um, things that are digestible, that are easily um, embraced by a majority. Like if I write something and it resonates with one person then they identify something of themselves in me as a, as a organic person or in, in three words that I wrote down, then goal, goal <laughs> achieved. <laughs> so um, I've, been, I've been fortunate in that I haven't found any um, detractors or if, if there are detractors, they're keeping they're keeping pretty quiet. So um, I feel like as somebody reached their hand back and, and pulled me up onto a platform, it's my moral imperative to keep reaching out and reaching back and 
if there's someone who wants to write, um, please reach out to me. I don't know much, but what I know I'll tell you and um, drag you to poetry readings with me. Um, I see Ben Trigg is here. He's an amazing person and advocate and friend. And um, immediately after this interview is his reading series, which is called Two Idiots Peddling Poetry. Um, there's an invite on Facebook. Um, ben, if you can drop the link into the chat, that would be amazing. And um, Ben has been just so instrumental in creating a space that's so welcoming. It's an amazing open mic experience. Um, and I'm one who goes kicking and screaming to open mics. And probably for the first year I was attending, I was like, I'm just going to sit here and listen. And then People are like, oh, if you're writing poetry, you might as well read it aloud. And um, it's, I have a lisp. I, that's all I can hear when I talk. And now I have Invisalign, so it's even more, it's even more exaggerated. But um, with the with the encouragement of friends, I've you know started stepping up to the mics and um, reading things that are not even finished, reading things that are drafts, and reading um, things about subject matter that I'm not entirely comfortable with. And it's pushed me so much as a writer. It's pushed me so much as a human and I'm just grateful. I'm grateful. Beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh, Rooney told me to. Ben, you're so funny. <laughs> um, um, so yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, so I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think, you know, you talk about decolonization and stopping writing for a white audience and um what do you think our country needs most right now when it comes um, to writing and voices and poetry and how can think, how can a new way of working with language usher in a more inclusive way of being for us um inclusivity includes um giving platform to all voices that have been silenced and marginalized, whether that's the LBGTQ community, um, people who are disabled, people who are formerly incarcerated, people who are part of the neurodiverse spectrum, women, um, immigrants. There's so many people who have never had a place at the table. And, and there's this idea of build a longer table. It's like, no. It, it, you just shouldn't have to build your own table, you know? Um, there have been so many great outlets that are geared towards people of color, um, LGBTQ people who have created their own spaces. And I think that's great and nurturing and necessary, but it should also be part of the mainstream culture. Like you shouldn't have to go to a Sri Lankan American women's writers group. Like I should be present in any writers group. Um, I think the selection of um, Amanda Gorman was genius because it made poetry accessible and it normalized poetry. It normalized a woman of color and a young woman of color at that, um, having a place on a world stage. Like what's taken so long? What's taken so long? Through that. If, if people from um, World Re Wrestling Federation have a global stage, not not to um, disparage that form of entertainment, which is valid and entertaining. Um, why shouldn't, you know, queer writers, why shouldn't formerly incarcerated poets, why, why shouldn't anyone who has a life story to tell be denied access? So I think the changing face of poetry is going to be representing the people who are out there. Good Lord. You know, like I have was lucky enough to work on this incredible collection called Red Shify, hope, um, shameless plugging. And um, I was a guest editor of this book It and, um, and people who are in this audience are in this book, which is very exciting to me. And um, part of my mission was to reach out to people, not just in California um, and not just the normal people I'm used to fraternizing with. I'm so lucky I know it's such a diverse group of poets. I mean, there's a really well-known poet, Brandon Constantine, and one of his students are both in this book. I, I think that's amazing. And like my vision when I was working with the editor-in-chief was, I wanna hear as many different perspectives gathered in one place. Um, the focus of the book is about the year 2020, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, 
it was just amazing to to read the first proof and to see like what people's experiences were and there it some of it's creative nonfiction some of it's flash fiction some of it's poetry and um we were also separated last year and there are so many stories out there and um, i'm so proud of this book because there's so many different perspectives all you know in this tiny slim little volume but i think all of writing should be like that like people ask me about you know the collection i'm working on with silver star labs um which is going to be titled to revere place which is our first the address of our first house in um in rockland county new york but after i picked the name i also realized it can mean to revere a place, um, not necessarily just a geographic place. And um, people think like, oh, you're, you're going to write about the Asian American experience. And yes, that's happenstance, though. Like I'm writing about an American family. We've lived here for 50 years plus. It's, you know, it's not it's not a foreign experience. It's not an immigrant experience. It's an American experience. And I think the definition of what an American life is really needs to be exploded. Like I, I get the question, I get comments still to this day, I'm 51 years old. You know, I get comments about where are you from? No, where are you really from? And I think I'm really from New York. <laughs> I'm currently from Orange County or comments like, I speak English really well. Um, it's my mother tongue. And part of me feels like, yes, I've mastered the language of my oppressor. You know, <laughs> I don't wanna be this angry person of color, but if that's what it takes to dismantle the ivory tower one brick at a time, so be it. Oh yes. You know, I, I don't wanna be the voice of my people, but if it's voiced it onto me, I'm gonna grab a megaphone. <laughs> start shouting you know and it, it's not a position that I'm super comfortable with um, people who know me best uh, know that I, I tend towards the shy and retiring <laughs> and um, and would would much prefer to sit in the back of the room and listen to other people and appreciate um, the tales they tell but somehow this whole writing thing has taken on a life of its own and I'm running to catch up with it and um, if people think it's, I don't find myself an inspiring person whatsoever. I think I'm like an anonymous citizen, if anything. But if people are inspired to pick up a pen, then pick it up. <laughs> you know, that's what's the worst that can happen? That's what I was going to ask. Actually, happen? like, what um, for those shy, other shy people in the audience or shy writers? What would you say to them? What should they do? How should they develop their work? How should they develop their voices? For me, um, the first thing was community. Like from that first reading series I went to, um, people were so kind. And just to see a room full of people listening, just listening, like not listening to respond, not you know planning their responses, but just like letting other people's stories wash over them was just an illuminating experience. And um, Community has been the only thing that's propelled me to keep going, quite honestly. I'm not disciplined at all. I'm not someone who journals every day. I'm not someone who would write every day. But I mean, if you have designs to write, find yourself a group. It can be at your local library. Um, going to open mics is incredible because you see people putting themselves out there and, um, and, and gaining friendships and gaining audience and, um, their words inspire other people to write. Um, so the only way I've even been able to like get a foothold is to meet people and be a good literary citizen. If your friend writes a book, buy the book. You know, <laughs> if you're willing to spend $20 on sushi, you should be willing to spend $20 on someone's collection of poetry or their first novel or their kid's novel or an anthology that, you know, if your friend has one poem in a book, pay $20 to have that one poem. You know, people are willing to invest their money in in very transient things. And poetry is not glamorous. It's not sexy, but it's so necessary. It's so necessary and just lift other people up. 
like if if you want to write like getting over your own inertia is the biggest obstacle or at least it was for me but surrounding myself with um soulful talented smart genuine people which is the only thing i found in the literary community um has been so inspiring and so edifying and if if you want to write start with you know go to a coffee house and listen to somebody read poems about a puppy or whatever it is and you know everyone has something to say about the human experience and it may not be your cup of tea but it, it takes chutzpah to get up on a mic and talk i'm still very reticent to do it um but I go and um, people sign me up against my will. And so I read something, you know, and it may not be very good and my voice may shake or will guaranteed to shake, but that's how you get started. And by being a good literary citizen, like I was flabbergasted when people asked me to participate in things. I thought like, I have one poem. Why would you ask me to read? <laughs> I, I, I know no one and I have no talent, but, you know, it was the impetus for me to start writing more often. And, you know, I went to book signings. I went, you know, I baked cookies for people's book launches because that's what friends do. It seems pretty simple. I think it's pretty simple, but um, it's funny how, how people, and especially now with, um, with the quarantine, it's so easy to get involved. If you're a uh, turn your camera off and hang around in your pajamas kind of person, um, log on to a Zoom and you can listen from the comfort of your own home. You can attend readings, you can attend book launches, you can attend workshops. I've found so many free workshops where people, big hearted people are willing to help you develop craft, you know, or at least give you encouragement. You know, it's incredible how many you know, low cost, sliding scale, free, even the paid ones, worth the money, worth the money. You can study with some incredible LA area poets through UCLA Extension, all on Zoom, um, where, you know, not everyone can afford an MFA or a residence, low residency program. But I mean, I go to a free workshop two or three times a week and have gotten nothing but love and nothing but encouragement and nothing but great, honest, gentle feedback. And, you know, it, it's amazing. And like, I work on poems and then, you know, with their, their encouragement, send them out. And sometimes they get published and I think, oh my God, you know, you can log onto a website and my words are there. It's crazy. It's a crazy idea. I never thought this would happen to me. And it did. <laughs> we want to hear more, 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 more. Um, in that vein, how can folks stay in touch with you and where can we find your work too? Funny, you should ask. <laughs> um, I uh, am working on getting a author website up and running. I am, I'm a consummate technophobe. So uh, techie people, and this means you Shahed, um, need to really push me to get on, you know, Squares Squarespace or WordPress or something and set up a site. Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram. Uh, I'll put my Instagram handle in the chat. Um, I'm on Facebook. Beautiful. And you know, you're welcome to reach out to me on Facebook, send me a friend request or whatever. And um, I don't post a lot of my own work on my social media, but I do post information on where it can be had. Um, I'm going to post a couple of Amazon links. Um, so this first one is for the undulating line, which is the belly dance, uh, writing poetry through belly dance book. Um, Women run press, incredible poet, Shannon Phillips. Um, she was one of the first people I met in the poetry community and has been nothing but gold to me. Um, so encouraging. She is an incredible editor. She's an incredible poet in her own right. And um, she's someone who has really given platform to a lot of underrepresented voices, especially women. Um, I'm so proud of this book. Um, Alexandra blurbed the book. 
she is one of the best literary citizens out there. She is the most supportive friend. And, um, you know, even if you have no interest in belly dance, <laughs> support local presses. It's, you know, it's how a lot of us get our starts. It's incredible if you get picked up by Simon and Schuster. The reality is they don't really publish a whole lot of poetry. It's, it's very um, grassroots, which is good because it gives us a lot more freedom. Um, I, so there is a anthology coming, pardon me, I'm gonna just grab a tissue because I tend to get very emotional and weepy. So pardon me for just a second. Take your time, take your time. Um, there's an incredible local press called um, Moontide Press. A lot of people here are published authors by Moontide Press. Um, the first time I submitted to a blind submission um, work that I thought, oh, no one's ever gonna pick anything I send, um, was picked up by Moontide Press in this incredible anthology called um, Dark Ink, which is a horror themed anthology great Halloween present for people <laughs> and um, just really fun anthology. Eric Morago, um, the editor-in-chief, is good people and has become a really dear friend of mine. Um, currently, they are, um, launch, they are in the middle of, or actually towards the end of a Indiegogo campaign. I'm going to post the link for a anthology that's coming out titled um, Shit Men Say to Me. It is a, res it is a poetic response and, uh, to toxic masculinity. So it's, <laughs> this idea was born out of, I think, um, a Facebook Live event with one of the Moontide authors. And we were just like chatting and, you know, chatting afterwards and saying, it's just incredible the kind of comments you get as a woman, the kind of things men feel that they could, they, they have the right to say. And off the cuff, I was like, yeah, we should just make a book called The Shit Men Say to Me. And, um, and lo and behold, it's a book. <laughs> and it's edited by Victoria McCoy, right? It is Victoria Lynn McCoy, who is the loveliest of lovelies, is one of the three co-editors. The other two are Hanalena Fennell and um, Dania Alcooley. Um, so women powered anthology and I'm really looking forward to see the different voices that are in this book and it's not just women it's there are a lot of men too like men bear the brunt of the toxic masculinity they're raised with just as much as women do and so um, strongly encourage people to pre-order this book and as an added incentive um, if you pre-order through the Indiegogo campaign, you will receive with your book a handmade bookmark that I'm that I will have crocheted for you. I've made 110 of them so far. So um, pre-sale is the Go -Go Indiegogo campaign is through the end of this month. And uh, yes, I've been in the craft cave busily crocheting. <laughs> Here's one now. <laughs> So um, I've made uh, over a hundred of these little things and um, it will be included as a thank you for ordering. It's hard during the pandemic to launch books because there aren't events where people can come and purchase them. Yeah. And, you know, and the burden of mailing them out falls with the press. So, um, so that's why they've elected, Moontide is elected to go with an Indiegogo campaign. And um, it should be a fun read and a thought provoking one at that. So I do really encourage you to um, check out the Indiegogo campaign, or you know, if you want to wait until it's launched in the world, you can order it from Moontide Press. Um, check out the campaign, everybody. Please check out the campaign. Pre-orders really can make or break a book. Um, so I would really encourage you to pre-order. It's just, it's a good thing to do. It supports local businesses and it gives them, you know, having an editor have to front all that money is, is a burden. And um, if you pre-order, it can really extend the life of a book or make the life of a book. Um, I was going to take a few questions. Do you want to share another link, though? Because I would love. Yes, um, this is a link to Redshift 5. Out, it's um, that anthology out by a, pre a local press called Arroyo Seco. They're based in Long Beach, California. Um, the editor is just 
the it's just a gentle, wonderful man, and um, I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity to work with him and um, and and experience publishing from the other side, and realize what a labor of love putting a book together really is. So um, I have so much appreciation, um, and it's there are a lot of incredible authors in this book, many of whom are here tonight. <laughs> so. If you want to, if you want to reflect upon 2020 and the crazy that it was, um, that's the book for you. And finally, um, please check out Silver Star Labs. They will be publishing my full length collection. Um, Author Powered Press, they are out of Long Beach, California and have been, when um, Ra Avis, who is an incredible human, an incredible literary citizen and writer, reached out to me and um, said that they would like to publish my first full length collection. I, I was just gobsmacked, like you would want a whole book of what I have to say. And um, she's South Asian, she's Latina. She is just an amazing woman. And her team um, is just, has been so warm and welcoming and, um, they're like my book whisperers. They like keep saying, you can do this. You can write a hundred poems. <laughs> I just thought that's a lot of words, people. <laughs> but um, they have a lot of great work coming out this year. They published Donnie Jackson's first full length collection um, titled Boy, amazing African-American writer and um, just a powerhouse of a person. And um, his book was my first brush with Silver Star Labs. Um, my great friend, Bill Friday, has a book with them called The Death on Skunk Street. Um, Jonathan Warner has a book coming out with them. Mark Sid has a book coming out with them. And there's just going to be a lot of really great work coming out. And next year, spring, will be um, To Revere Place, which is my book. But once again, a local press, um, support local artists. Like, this is, this is how people's lives get launched. And um, if it's not for their generosity, I would not have the emotional wherewithal to do this alone. It takes community to make any of this happen. And also like, please reach out to me on social media. I'm, I'm pretty receptive to that. Um, if, I, if I recognize you or if we have Carly in common, I'll, I'll know that you're not, you know, trying to lure me into a pyramid scheme. <laughs> so, and I'm happy to, I, I don't know much, but whatever I know, I will pass along to you um, to the best of my ability. I'll point you in a wholesome direction if you want a workshop, if you want to talk to a local press, if you, if you want just to talk about stuff, I'm, I'm here for you. I just want to send love to everybody tonight. Thank you for coming to the Little Lighthouse. It's It feels so good on these crazy weeks when things happen to be in community with people and to just feel like we can uh, find a little inspiration in each other and move things just a little forward. So I'm truly grateful for everyone who came. Shawhead is in Washington, DC and your eyes must be getting so heavy, my friend. And my sister's in Michigan. Um, I hope she took a party nap before she got onto this. Um, I've got friends from my workshop, from various different workshops, people from Moontide, and um, I'm humbled that you're here. I'm humbled to know you. Awesome, everybody. Yes, oh yes, let's do it again. We were such a great audience that one last time, on the count of three, let's do a last round of applause for Arumi. One. <laughs> oh yeah, take yourselves off mute. Everybody take yourselves off mute. One, <laughs> two, three. Good job, Ernie. <laughs>